Hi. Good me? evening, Jane. Hi. You can't see me. I have to turn something on here. Yeah. Unknown caller. Hello? Mike, is it safe to assume you're from Chester? No, I'm from Essex. Oh, you are. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, we haven't met. I'm, I'm... I was only on one other uh, one other uh, Essex uh, Planning Commission meeting. I I logged in earlier. Okay. I'm with, uh, I'm with the Sustainable Essex Committee. You are okay. Okay, I'm sorry. We have. We probably have. That's right. Then. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure, you've met about a hundred people so far, <laughs> or more. Let's see. And
Hi, Alan. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Hi, thank you. Hi, John. Good evening, George. Oh, hi, John. And who's that? Yeah. Pat Bais Baisaki. How are you? Good. How are you? <laughs> Good, thanks. Okay. John, I'm here. It's George. I see you. Okay. Sorry. I, I, yeah. Alan, I've got I got emails from both uh, Gary Riggio and Aaron Bogan that they are not available. Good to know. Thank you. Not that a quorum is the most important thing, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Alan, how are you doing? <clears throat> Fine, thank you, George. Good. I had melanoma surgery. Oh. <laughs> Oh, how are you doing? Uh, uh, doing fine. It, it came out negative. I just have to go down to the plastic surgeon next week and they have to, uh, you know, close it up. So, yeah. We had lunch with a friend today who had part of his ear removed. For, for melanoma. He had a big bandage on his ear. Really weird. Oh, I, I, I had that done. <laughs> you do? Oh, your ear looks fine. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I had a problem with it, though. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, John, at this point, it looks like we're going to be a little short for a quorum. Yeah, we have we have a couple of minutes, but yeah, it, uh, <clears throat> so we'll just have to uh, do go right to the presentation and not do our right. do our uh, business. Ah, wait, no, here comes your quorum. Beautiful. Wow, you haven't Torrance. Looking very nautical. Indeed. Hey, John. Slappy, how are you? Oh, oh, that's right. Slappy. <laughs> Slappy. I, think I, think I remember that one. Snappy. Hey, Bruce. <clears throat> hey, Torrance. How are you? Uh, just living that dream, man. Oh, good. It's good to hear. Hi, Jane. Hi. Long time no see. Yeah. Sounds nice today. <laughs> All right, uh, people. <clears throat> um, since this is officially an Essex Planning Commission meeting, I'm going to uh, commandeer, take control. <clears throat> um, so we, we have enough for a quorum here. So we're just going to open up the meeting and uh, 
take care of a little business and then we'll get right into the presentation. <clears throat> so uh, the Essex Planning Commission will uh, come to order for its regular meeting uh, Thursday, August 13th, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. meeting remotely. Uh, present for tonight's meeting are regular members <clears throat> George Sexton and Alan Kerr. Seated for Aaron Bogan will be Jane Cyrus and seated for Gary Riccio will be Hope Proctor. Um, did I miss anybody of the uh, planning commission? Uh, this is Al Wolf. This is Al Wolfgram on the call. Oh, hi, Al. I didn't. Sorry, I didn't see you there. So Al Wolfgram will be seated for Ralph Monaco. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So that, uh, that takes care of that. Uh, we're just going to uh, have a motion to approve minutes. Do I hear one? So moved. From the uh, July twenty twenty meeting. Uh, second on that. Second. Second. Uh, any discussion on the minutes? All right, then hearing none, uh, all those in favor of approval? Aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. <clears throat> okay, that's uh, all we really wanted to attend to. At this point, uh, we'd like to, uh, well, I guess uh, let me just say a uh, welcome to the uh, Deep River and the Chester Planning Commission members who have joined us for this occasion and to the uh, representatives from River Cog. <clears throat> um, at this point, we're gonna turn the meeting over to River Cog so they can make their uh, POCD presentation. So, Megan, I guess that's you. Great, thank you. Um, if I could just get screen sharing. All right, Megan, I just made you the host. Hopefully you can share your screen. Perfect. There's Ken. I must put this on mute. Oh, everyone can see that all right? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you also to the Essex, Chester and Deep River Planning and Zoning Commissions for allowing us this time to speak with you this evening. My name is Megan Jufliss. I'm a senior planner with the Lower Connecticut River Valley Council of Governments or River Cog. And joining me in giving this presentation is River Cog's Deputy Director, Torrance Downs. At this time, we usually recognize the RPC members in attendance, um, <clears throat> Alan Kerr of Essex, Michael Sanders of Chester, Bruce Edgerton of Deep River. Um, does anybody have a few words they want to say about the RPCD or anything for the group? Uh, this is my, uh, <laughs> Hearing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we would like to begin this with a brief presentation followed by an open discussion based on the five questions that were circulated prior to the meeting. So with that, let's begin. Uh, why are we here? As a reminder, River Cog, the Regional Planning Committee, RPC, and our consultant Fitzgerald and Halliday are working on the first regional plan of conservation and development, RPOCD, for the Lower Connecticut River Valley region. On June 29th and July 7th, we held region-wide introductory presentations that offered a primer on River Cog, the Regional Planning Committee, and the RPOCD. We'll begin tonight's presentation with a brief recap of the key takeaways from the introductory presentation, which is also available on the project website, rivercogregionalplan.org. We'll also spend a few minutes explaining what we by the region and why it is that we think regionally. The purpose of this discussion is to frame our perspective. Although we're here to learn about your town's issues and goals, we are working on a regional plan. So it's important to keep in mind that our focus should be on how your town's issues and goals fit into the region as a whole. We'll highlight some examples of this by showcasing a few goals from each of your POCDs and comparing them across the region. We'll then turn the rest of the meeting over to you to discuss. John Bennett. John Bennett. John Bennett. John Bennett. John Bennett. <laughs> Sorry about that. Turn my phone off. <laughs> Mr. Bennett. Uh, at the introductory presentation, we set out to answer a few key questions, which I'll briefly recap. Why are we here? As I mentioned at the outset, we're creating the regional plan of conservation and development. What is River Cog? the Regional Planning Organization for the Lower Connecticut River Valley. What is the RPC? The RPC is made up of appointed representatives from each of our 17 towns 
and has been tasked to oversee the creation of the RPO CD. And what is the RPO CD? It's a visionary policy document that guides land use patterns in the region over the next 10 years. Also at the introductory presentation, we answered the question of why we think regionally. Because thinking regionally can help our municipalities solve common problems and achieve common goals. But what do we mean by region? Specifically, we're talking about the Lower Connecticut River Valley, which is made up of 17 municipalities, Chester, Clinton, Cromwell, Deep River, Durham, East Haddam, East Hampton, Essex, Haddam, Killingworth, Lyme, Middlefield, Middletown, Old Lyme, Old Saybrook, Portland, and Westbrook. Each of these municipalities is unique in character, but their geographic proximity means that certain common conditions will exist among them and that certain issues and goals will necessarily be shared. In addition, many issues and goals will have impacts that cross municipal boundaries. In other words, what happens in Essex may have impacts that reach Deep River. The unique character of each municipality also means that each has its own strengths and weaknesses. Our municipalities are interdependent, relying on each other in areas such as housing, jobs, infrastructure, and critical public services. As part of the RPOCD, we'll be examining these common issues and goals, as well as the areas where our towns are interdependent, and provide a roadmap for coordination and cooperation. And part of this effort, hearing from you about what matters to your town is critically important. Although this is the first RPOCD for the Lower Connecticut River Valley region, it's important to reiterate that we're not starting from zero. Our analysis of common issues and goals began with a review of the municipal POCDs for all 17 municipalities. After our review, we compared POCDs and found that they do, in fact, share a great deal in common. So let's start with Chester and look at some of the goals from Chester's POCD. But first, my disclaimer, I'd like to note that these goals were chosen to showcase the breadth of topics covered and they were not meant to imply a particular level of importance. So one, increase pedestrian, bicycle, and transit connectivity throughout the region to enhance quality of life, enable active lifestyles, and promote natural resource appreciation. Two, diversify Chester's housing stock while protecting existing neighborhoods and community character. Three, support water-based recreation and tourism along the riverfront. Four, maintain the village district as the economic, social, and cultural hub of the community by supporting vibrant mixed-use development, appropriate design, and community activity in civic uses. You'll start to see some trends as we go through these here. So let's look at Essex POCD. One, enhance multimodal transportation connect connections and expand appropriate public infrastructure within and between villages and hubs and improve Essex's connection to surrounding communities. Two, expand the variety of housing options available throughout Essex, including more affordable housing opportunities in both mixed use developments and within traditional subdivision developments. Three, promote more public access to the riverfront for both active and passive recreation and enhance pedestrian connections to mitigate traffic and parking concerns. Four, promote mixed use, compact, architecturally appropriate development and redevelopment in villages of Centerbrook, Essex and Ivoryton and in key hubs of Buckham Corner and Route 9 Gate. And finally, we'll take a look at Deep Rivers POCD. One, maintain and enhance the pedestrian nature of Deep River Center and its surrounding areas to the greatest extent practicable. Two, maintain a diverse population, providing housing and services for residents of various age groups, economic levels, and cultural backgrounds while being consistent with resource limitations. Three, reassert the town's historic relationship to the waterfront. Four, enable mixed uses in existing older buildings as much as possible to maintain historic context when doing so would facilitate the preservation and reuse of the building. So now when we look across the region at all of the municipal POCDs, we see that these goals are very widely shared. 
All 17 towns had goals related to improving bicycle and pedestrian connections. All 17 towns also had goals related to diversifying housing stock. 16 <coughs> towns had goals related to tourism and recreation, with, uh, with many specifically mentioning access to the waterfront. And 14 towns had goals related to encouraging mixed use, particularly in the town centers. Mm. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Torrance to run the question and answer portion. Hello again, everybody. Um, as Megan said, we've reviewed uh, your plans and made regional comparisons and uh, we've looked based on the data and our own professional experience, but you all live in each of your towns. Um, you have an intimate understanding of you know, what your towns are, uh, what your towns need, what makes them special. Um, so before we turn to the, to the five questions, um, we usually have procedural issues that we try to go over. We talk about you know, 10 minutes per question. Um, if we exceed that time, we can come back to it later. Uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll just take a shot at this. And, um, you know, it usually doesn't go past 10 minutes or so, but if it does, um, it does. And um, Alan, I, I think what we'll do is um, have you call on people. Uh, you know, if people want to use the raise your hand uh, function in, in uh, Zoom, you can do that. Otherwise, we haven't had much issue with uh, you know people being recognized and uh, Alan you can go ahead and do that if you don't mind instead of me um, uh, well I'm frankly uh, Torrance I'd be asking, I'm not I'm not particularly uh, adept at uh, running a zoom meeting uh, although we <laughs> we certainly had a few but um, I'm happy to let you uh, okay. handle, handle this function if you'd like okay yeah and um, I know there are six, there are 28 of us on the call here, which is great. Um, there are six phone members. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you guys uh, are interested in talking, uh, I guess speak up or somehow we'll figure you out. Uh, but otherwise just uh, call out and, um, and I'll call on people and I'm gonna take notes and, uh, you know, pretty much be quiet while you guys are speaking. So, um, all right, well, why don't we get going here? Can, can uh, I just make a request really quickly? Um, before you uh, give your response, would you mind saying which town you're answering oh, good from? Point, good point. So we can keep tabs on who we're getting answers from. Okay, and, and the other thing is, uh, you know, these, these five questions, I think most of you have seen them, uh, are pretty broad, and 10 minutes isn't a tremendous amount of time. Uh, to provide input from these things. But if, if you have other things to say and we don't have time for it, or if you think of something after this meeting, uh, at the end, we have email addresses that you can send more comments to. Uh, you know, we'll be happy for anything additional you have uh, after we talk you know, for the next 45 minutes or, or whatever. Um, and again, those, we'll post those email addresses at the end. Megan, Sam Gold, me, and then the uh, six RPC members. So, uh, so we'll give you those that information. And uh, all right. So uh, so the first question we have uh, the nice broad one. Um, what would be your vision for the Lower Connecticut River Valley region? If anybody wants to jump in? Go ahead. This and is this in. is Al, Al. This is Al Wolfram on the telephone. Hi, Al. How are you doing? Good. I would think uh, the vision would be keep it, its historic character. I would add that this is Jane Stiles from Essex, and I would add that um, it's a, it's an incredibly beautiful area that's been very stable and managed to keep its integrity. The, the river, while there's been a lot of development it's still an incredibly beautiful river and it's very different than places like the hamptons where development has ramped along <clears throat> it's become very busy and i think whatever wherever our development goes we ought to keep in mind that what we have is very precious and we should develop in a way <clears throat> in such a way that we can keep that beauty 
Thank you, Jane. That was a good one. Uh, th this is Mike Long from Essex. Um, kind of capitalizing, or kind of piggybacking on that point. Um, from a regional perspective, um, I think we've got to find a way to uh, kind of knit the uniqueness of each of the municipalities together in a, in a regional way so that on one hand you're protecting or enhancing the uniqueness of each municipality, but also uh, creating kind of a regional identity for the communities as a whole. Yep, that's, you hit the nail right on the head, Mike. Um, this is Alan. If um, I, I'd just like to add that I, I think one common theme uh, that, that gets brought up a lot is the uh, the uh, drifting away from from this region of young people, and um, you know I, I think it's important that we find ways to keep or even attract younger families to settle in this area, and uh, what that means. In, in you know in practice I'm not really sure I think in affordable housing is part of that and um, you know some kind of economic development some some reason for, for young people to settle here I think is important um, so that would be another part of my vision for the region just to toggle on top of that I think along with that goes with is diversity it's, yeah. a, it's a, very, 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 very a homogenous community age-wise race-wise and uh, we, we need young people, but we need all kinds of people. Thank you, Jane. Good one. Yeah, and I, if I could, uh, this is Hope Proctor from Essex. I think <clears throat> Alan has a good point um, about bringing in more younger people and encouraging it. I think, like, for Essex, it's kind of hard. It's a small town. They're all small towns. So what's great about this conservation plan for all the region would be if we work together, maybe, you know, where one town provides one, something for young people and that the other towns couldn't like, maybe it's jobs or entertainment um, or housing. So if we pull together our resources, we could bring people in this area. So if you're living in Essex, maybe you work in Deep River or um, Killingworth and you, you're in, doing entertaining or whatever and going out in Saybrook. So, I think we need a stronger connection in, the, in these towns to bring more people. Thanks, Hope. Anybody else? Uh, this is Mike Sanders from Chester. Hey, Mike. And uh, hey, Torrance. Uh, I guess my Part of my perspective is I'm not a native Connecticuter, nutmegger, whatever we call ourselves. Uh, I'm a blow-in. I've only lived here for 25 years. <laughs> um, but but one of my observations just generally, and, and you know I do have a planning background and a transportation background, but I'll try not to dwell on that too much. Uh, I don't know that there's any place else in the country where you can ask somebody how many towns are in your state and people would know the answer to it. <laughs> That we've got 169 towns and of course everyone is unique and there's really a, a disincentive if not a lack of desire to do a lot of coordination among the towns obviously our three towns are exceptions we have a regional school district we have regional emergency services 911 uh, and health districts and all those but I think part of my vision for the valley is to really start thinking in terms of that it's a valley it's not 17 towns or just the six towns and or seven towns in the lower valley really thinking in terms of uh how we can work together i know through economic development we've got our some of our economic development commissions working together uh, i look at lime dealing with airbnb issues right now which chester dealt with last year uh are we need to find ways to open those lines of communication amongst ourselves and uh, really find better ways to coordinate uh, really have those open lines of communication and then also building a little bit on what some other people said we can't be everything none of our towns can be everything to everybody uh in chester we like to say hey if we want to go with dunkin donuts we don't have to build one here because haddam has got two of them and deep river has one and that's fine it's but we're a region so you know we can't go supermarket shopping in chester we have to go someplace else 
try, try and build on that interrelationship of the towns and, and see if the towns, as they work together, can come up with better solutions to uh, meeting the regional needs and not just our town needs. Good, Mike. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, George Sexton, Essex. Hi, George. Uh, hi, how are you? Uh, you know, the one big thing about this whole area, and it came up with what you were talking about, is the river is a key part of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we could all do to enhance whatever we can uh, with, with the river, I think makes sense, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm... Uh... Oh, sorry, hand, hand raised. <laughs> Cindy Lignar from Chester. I'm the alternate member. And um, I, I'd like to echo too how important it is to attract younger uh, families and the youth um, and to employ them here, to house them here, and, and a diverse, uh, to improve our diversity in our area as well. And part of that is is creating or expanding on our outside activities, um, like the bike paths and the hiking um, and sidewalks, um, and connecting our communities with those. I think we should be connected through all of our, in my opinion, and all of our uh, through all of our state routes and roads. A lot of us bike, a lot of us run, including me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's an attraction when my husband and I travel. Okay, so are there bike paths? Are there routes? Where can we go hiking? We could really um, use that, use that, expand it, and promote it for tourism here too, and to attract younger people. Yeah. Outdoor venues, access to the river, bike paths, sidewalks, all of that. Absolutely. I'm wondering, is there a way, um, you know, we have the river that connects these towns, but so does the rail system. You know, in a lot of other uh, states they see, or even cities, they have a rail line that maybe becomes, maybe an old abandoned one where it becomes a bike path. But is there some adjacent to the rail line that can become maybe a hiking path that connects through, or a bike path that connects all the way down? those towns. No, this is Richard, oh, Holloway. Oh, Richard Holloway from Chester. Um, there's an organization called Rails to Trails and uh, yeah. they have had a number of issues of their magazine dedicated to the very uh, issue of, of being able to share both rails and bordering trails and I, I'll pass those on to River Cog. Thanks, Rick. That's uh, really important. I mean, and north of of, of um, Tylerville is probably the most beautiful views of the river there are, and uh, that would be the ideal rail trail. Mm -hmm. But it is regional. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rick and and Cindy, uh, the town of Haddam and some, I guess most of the folks are from the town of Haddam are working on a a plan kind of like that. They call it the green blue plan. Yes. And at this point, they're uh, trying to pull in advocates. Uh, River Cog's been, uh, you know, part of the discussions. And it's the uh, the rail there from Haddam on up to Middletown. And I, many of you have probably seen uh, newspaper articles about, um, you know, those uh, rail bikes that Valley Railroad has put up there. And, and uh, this group has uh, some interesting broad plans for expanding that type of access with access to the river. And they're particularly looking uh, to enhance Hagenham, but it's just that kind of broad uh, plan idea for just that type of activity, but in a regional sense. And that, that's why they've pulled in uh, River Cog, and they're looking at, you know, the Chambers of Commerce, and uh, it's it's at a very early stage. Uh, there's some challenges with it, but it's Cindy and Rick, exactly what you're talking about. So right. those, those are great comments. Thank you. Yeah, 
anybody else on on uh, bike trails, hiking, any type of uh, recreation like that? Well, one thing that I'd, I think we, we might want to think of our area, and our tourism is a very important part of our economy. We might think of us ourselves as an eco-tourist economy because we have all these outdoor activities and there's not just the biking, there's also all of the open space corridors and the birding beaches. It's a wonderful place for outdoor activities. And we might just want to think of ourselves in that in those terms. Right. We also have, a, it seems, a, a lot of uh, state, state forest acreage around here right. in our region. <clears throat> Um, also, you know, we've, we've got uh, some really great uh, cultural assets in, with, with the arts. Um, it, you know, Chester, Essex, mm -hmm. uh, both visual arts, music, uh, certainly uh, performing arts. So that's, again, from a regional perspective, that's uh, a way to create some identity. Yeah, and over there in Lyme and Old Lyme, the, the Art Academy and, and yeah. all of those, absolutely, all part right. of this region. and. Uh, yeah, assets to uh, promote. And the museums. Yes. Yeah, museum. There are a lot of cultural and arts uh, assets in this region. It's really amazing. Also, um, is it okay if I just speak? Or yeah. Please, <laughs> jump in. Also, with um, including with the outdoor activity, there's a lot of paddle boarding, canoeing, and kayaking. Those are huge activities in our area as well. So having, you know, optimizing the access to waterways um, in the Connecticut River, oh, but maybe less the Connecticut River, more waterways and streams. And I know in the Chester POCD, I believe there was one site, I think by Moravella's, um, where they wanted to focus on having access there for canoes and and kayaks or, or just better designated and more optimized, cleared, cared for. Mm. Yeah. I know I know Chester has always been looking for more uh, water access. You've got Parker's Point um, mm -hmm. and I, I know they're, the town is looking to enhance down, down by uh, where Chester Creek runs into the river, but mm -hmm. that exactly. access to the river is uh, that's as Megan showed in one of those slides, a really mm -hmm. common thread for a lot of the towns on the river is mm -hmm. looking to promote that water access. Good one. Yeah, this is uh, George Sexton. Um, everything we've talked about sounds great. How can we promote it? Can we promote it? Uh, the river valley is kind of an entity that has all these things? That that, be... That's, that's uh, a good question. And uh, a couple of times, uh, in fact, just on Monday night, the uh, EDC chair in Clinton brought up the word branding. <laughs> and uh, uh. You know, the, the RPC has talked about that and wondered, is branding a part of this regional plan or is it a recommendation in the plan? that there should be a group put together whose uh, intent is to develop some side of kind of branding. It's not only the identity for those of us here in the Valley, but for those outside. And, you know, the example we used was when, when you say the Berkshires, you know, everybody knows what the Berkshires are and it encompasses a number of towns. Uh, you know, it's kind of based on the mountains. That's the core asset and down here we've got the river valley so uh, uh george that is another thing that hits the nail on the head Can, um the other thing with uh, bike paths and well especially bike paths and developing those um the other thought for me with that is improving safety along the roads so um in particular, our state roads. So again, a lot of us, I know a lot of people, including me, that bike and run, and um, for safety's sake, um, having bike, bike paths is important too. Um, yeah. And speed management. Are there speed management? So for me, that's a big deal for quality of life is are there any controls that we can put in place? And I know this is a big issue in Deep River, 
Um, there was a petition signed in Deep River. Um, I used to be on the Deep River Merchants Association. I used to own a business there, but um, at the Riverwind Bed and Breakfast in Deep River. Um, oh, near uh, shore discount liquor? Oh, right, exactly. Um, oh, now I know what you mean. Yeah, the owners, <laughs> yeah, I know the owners pretty well, and I know they worked with Angus on this too. Um, they're really concerned about speeding coming through town. And I know that there was a lot of discussion about it. And I think even to the state level, Angus could speak to that more. I see his name in the list. But yeah. um, speeding management on our roads, if there's any kind of physical way we could do that, besides having to enforce it, um, and for, for all the pedestrians, the bikers, the cyclists, um, that would be, to me, a very important thing to, to be able to manage. I think we should add on the rivers too. The river is yeah. 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 Way too much speeding on the river. Yeah. Uh, Cindy, I've heard those discussions about that bed and breakfast and the speed along right. there through 154. Mm -hmm. And it's not just this the, is a, yeah, it's not just yeah, this the, is Al, Al Wolf kind of related to bicycling and uh, pedestrian walking on streets and, and roadways. A lot of that has to do with the width of the road. We, we're an old community here, an old Connecticut is an old state, and the right of ways are so narrow in some of these places that they really can't uh, take biking and walking safely. So, you know, right of ways pay a, uh, play a good portion into what's safe and what's not. Not necessarily the speed of the vehicle uh, going up and down the street. But speeding is an so issue in our area. It's yeah. definitely an issue. Uh, I can I can imagine recommendations mm -hmm. that where where right of ways are adequate, um, you know, promote bike paths and hiking paths, you know, mm -hmm. kind of to address that uh, the knowledge that not all roads have sufficient right of ways, but you know where they are, we should be doing something. You know, mm -hmm. that's you know, it's, it's not it's not safe. It's it's not safe to stripe a two foot wide. Be a, a, a bicycle and pedestrian path on a state highway. So those things have to be, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, addressed in some way. Mm -hmm. You just can't put them everywhere. You got to have a safe place to put them. Right. Sure. And what about um, the grooved, the grooving in the roads? You know, to alert people if they're coming too close, because there's a lot of distracted drivers these days. Yes. You yeah. know, we're also thinking about going forward 10 years. Is that going to change? Is it going to get worse or better? Who knows? But right now, you know, there's a lot of distracted drivers. So maybe just grooves in the roads would improve safety. Yeah, they've done that on 145. I don't know if you've been up there near the airport and that stretch, the Winthrop Road. I've, I've been there. I haven't run there, but yes. If they have it just only down the center stripe, but I agree mm -hmm. with you that it uh, could be very useful. Um, a lot of good discussion here. Uh, you know, if there's uh, one or two more, should we do them? And then, uh, Alan, maybe move on to question number two. Sure. What do you all think? Hi. Um, could I? This is Susan Wright from uh, Chester. Um, I, I just wanted to, to, to talk about that the, there's five, the five economic development um, commissions from Haddam, East Haddam, um, Chester, Deep River, and Essex, we meet uh, a couple times a month. And is, we are, we've been working together for probably about a year or more doing exactly what you guys have been, you know, on a smaller scale of trying to work together and talk about all the different things that are going on in our town. And if you go to exploreconnecticutshoreline.com, um, the majority of us are up on that. And we are now working on putting a little menu together of, we were gonna do it sooner, but because of COVID, we had to stop. But what you could go to do with, if you had a day, and let's say you wanted to go visit alpacas, you could go do that. And then you could go eat here and you planned like a day for them um, of activities that were throughout, you know, the different towns. 
maybe, you know, not every single one every time, but um, so um, yeah, we have been working on a bunch of that. And we, like I said, we've been together for probably a little over a year now. And we're actually having John Williams, who's here in Chester, create a logo for us um, for uh, to identify us. You know, so we have that, but yeah, that's so I don't a great know. We idea. should probably be chatting more with you guys too, to you know, to be more cohesive, so that we're not all mm -hmm. working on the, or at least to let you know what we're working on. So, because we're trying to really work on the tourism side of it. Well, that's that's great, Susan. I uh, I don't, you know, uh, I wasn't aware of of the fact that your five EDCs are working together and. And this looks like it would be a great website. This is the kind of stuff we're talking about. Um, what were the five? You said Chester, Deep River, Essex? East Haddam. Yep, um, Haddam okay. and East Haddam. Okay. Hi, I wasn't and we thought once we got going, we would include other ones. But, you know, it's hard to work with. See, this is the pr thing that we've been finding. You know, we even working with the five of us is hard. So mm -hmm. trying to work with 17, you know, you try to get it together and you keep the momentum going and, and things like that. It's, it's not easy, but, you know, we, we seem to be moving forward, not just not as fast as we'd like to. Um, but well, COVID it's, it's did a throw great, a little... A great start that the five of you guys, the five EDCs are working together and have a website and then a logo. That's great. <laughs> and the other thing that we do is uh, if, if I got a call here in Chester for somebody who wanted to put in because a lot of times businesses will call, they want a warehouse a certain size. If I can't accommodate them, then we pass that information on to the other EDCs and put it out there. Because just because we can't accommodate a business coming in doesn't mean that we want them to leave the area. Uh -huh. So we try to work together that way also. Um, so it's That's, it's that's working, been brought up but, before too, that's, that's great. Well, yes. I, I think that so, that those remarks uh, pertain to uh, question three, uh, in terms of what what we can do most effectively as a region. And I think uh, you know economic development concerns or or ventures uh, certainly certainly lend themselves to a regional approach. Right. Right. Um, so let's go on to question two. And if anybody has thoughts on vision, we can come back to that. But uh, question two. Uh, what what do each of you see as each of your town's role in the region, Chester, Essex, and Deep River? You know, the individual towns, what are their roles in the region? Um, I, I'm not sure, I may not really be answering the question directly. I'm not sure what our role is, but I, I, think, I think Essex, this is Alan from Essex, um, you know, I, I think we offer a lot of attractions that bring people to the region. I think, you know, Essex Village, of course, is is beautiful <coughs> with the harbor. And, uh, and of course, the Iverton Playhouse and, and the steam train, I think, is one of the largest tourist attractions in the state. So I think we're we're kind of a magnet in the area for, uh, for tourism to some extent. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one role we play. I think another role, I, I, and it, it may not be unique to Essex, I, it certainly is not, I guess, but uh, I was just, you know, kind of amazed at the amount of medical facilities that are available here in a relatively short driving distance. So, mm -hmm. um, you yeah, know, just another, another, another thing we contribute. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Um, Mike, which town are you from? Essex. You're Essex too. Um, you know, Deep River? What about Deep River? Yeah. Yeah, what about Deep River? Yeah. Are you uh, guys still scruffy but proud, or is that? <laughs> yeah, of course, everything, you know, with COVID going on, it's, it's really affected everything um, as far as activities and, um, and plans. It's been kind of tough even being able to, to talk with people to find out, get a consensus within uh, management in the town, just because wow. of, of access to people at, at this time. But 
obviously we've we we now have the local grocery store so uh, mm -hmm. We we are a bit of a focus for the yeah no I you know, the towns around until until Essex gets back their colonial market. Yeah, I I think Deep River is really unusual around here because they offer the whole deal. They have they have a, a, a real urban situation. It's a, a, a short street, but they've got everything. You know, they've got the food store. They've got the the grocery the uh, the, the drug, drug store. store. Yeah, they mm -hmm. have restaurants. They have clothing. They, I mean, really, it's this is yeah. a little town. Yeah, with all the services and Essex certainly can't say that, and Chester can't say it either. Um, big problem, of course, well, in the Deep River. One of the big problems we got is that our main street in town is a state highway. Yeah. So, yeah, but but the traffic is very slow. I, you you don't see people speeding there because you have the traffic light. If I might, this is Angus speaking. Hi, Angus. Hey, just um. Just briefly, you know, I think that you all hit on something that, that I kind of think of Deep River as. I mean, we are of our region. If you want to, you know, the region can be as big as you want. We're talking right now, it's Chester, Deep River, and Essex. And I like to think of Deep River as the hub of those two communities. We've got a lot going on in Chester, a lot going on in Essex, and a lot going on in Deep River. But, but we're right in the middle and easy to get to from, from all those communities and easy to get to from a lot of the folks in our region. And, and while the the fact that our main street is a state highway has some um, uh, some challenges, it also creates um, that easy place to get to. And and I think that I'd like very much for the for the communities to to develop that hub, if you will. And I, I, I that's that's kind of what I see as Deep River's role. We're the center the center of the of the wheel of the region. Um, if if nothing else, just location-wise, but but we've got a lot going on, as as has been said. You know, we, we have the grocery store. We, go ahead. Parking, which is I think one of the key things, is there an adequate. That's one of the huge issues in Deep River, and, and there are, there's there's a huge lack of parking. But both all three of our communities have that right. same problem with our downtowns. Well, I, I've never had a problem parking in Deep River. I think they've got a good situation there. I mean, the, the, the big hubs, the, the grocery store and the drugstore, they have, you know, adequate parking lots. And it's still walkable. That's what's nice about Deep River. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's still pedestrian friendly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm envious of all your sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs> I have sidewalk envy about Deep River. <laughs> you have a lot of nice, you know, you guys got a lot of nice sidewalks. Susan right here from Chester, but, you know, I totally appreciate the the, having the um, pharmacy and the grocery store, and I think a lot of people do, because mm -hmm. it's, you don't have to go to Old Saybrook, not that you don't, you know, that, that it's that far, but it really provides a big service, I think, to the area by having those businesses there. Mm -hmm. What else is nice about Deep River? You know, people come from all over to go to the steam train or to the River Museum in mm -hmm. Essex. But you know, my kids, they want to go hang out in Deep River and walk around. There's more services for the local people, whether like it's the parks there that are walking distance to downtown or just, you know, because there's so many sidewalks, you can go from downtown to the river easy. Um, it's, it's really helps locally services. And Deep Rivers had the well, muster, we, the, the muster yeah. parade in normal times and yeah. family family day. Some good yeah. events that happen in uh, Deep River. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we talk about on this group with the economic development is that the railroad is a great, I mean, they do, when they had the um, concerts over in East Haddam, they used to come up, the train would stop at the uh, rail station in, on Railroad Avenue and pick people up and take them um, up to um the bridge and they people could walk across the bridge and go to the music and what we would like to try to do is figure out a way if you could go and stop and get off the train like how do you get people from the um from the chester railroad station that's right there and get them into town safely because a lot of those roads are so narrow and small that maybe having bicycles and things like that don't work so we were trying to talk with um, Nine Town Transit 
to see if there was any time that they would just be able to take a loop off of 154, maybe pick people up, take a, you know, go around in some of those different areas and even up in Essex, I'm not Essex, but um, East Haddam to do some similar things like that to promote getting people from the train to the town and then somehow get them back. Mm -hmm. so. You know, the steam train was such a, such a great, partner with the town during the muster the last few years where you know parking it's just impossible to park in deep river during the muster and f folks they were offering uh <clears throat> rides from essex up to deep river get off at the deep river station and they shuttled people up to down up into main street and then picked <laughs> them up three hours later or four hours later or five hours later it was it was a really a wonderful thing to uh to 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 watch them uh, just volunteer that effort. I mean, they uh, they charged barely anything for that service, and it really brought a lot of people, and saved a lot of cars from ha coming into town. Well, that's that's another regional initiative. That's that's yep. good. That's good. Anybody else on uh, town's roles? Um, we've talked about Essex and Deep River, uh, Chester. Well, Chester. Oh, Chester's restaurant. Chester's <laughs> restaurant. Chester's, it's got the arts. It's got visual, oh, awesome, musical, yeah. culinary. Um, it's yeah. the place to come for that. And once COVID's <laughs> over or under control, uh, I think it's really going to hopefully boom again. Mm -hmm. Right, and our, our construction, our uh, downtown <laughs> project's moving along. Right. So once once that that is done, it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be nice to have everybody back downtown again. You know, with COVID considerations, of course. I have Chester and I think it's one of the most beautiful streets around here. I, I love the way it winds around and opens up in the middle. And uh, beautiful. It's, it's an architectural treasure. Mm. And uh, I know Iberton has its uh, farmer's market, but the, the Chester's Chester farmer's market is, uh, yeah. that's really grown <laughs> and it's really popular, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's because we can close the street down easily, so people get that sense they can just walk around, they don't have to worry about cars, um, mm -hmm. you know, you have music, so there's a lot of good stuff going on. Um, but I think one of the things that, from just talking with, I'm, I'm, I work with the merchants too in town, and, you know, for all of these businesses, they have to now recreate themselves, and a lot of them are hanging by a thread because, you cannot run a restaurant on 50% or even 75% occupancy, you know, um, or even a bar. Um, retail, you know, only being able to have a certain amount of people. So, so the COVID and how we're going to move businesses forward is really going to, you know, when we get a vaccine or see how it goes. But right now, a lot of our businesses are kind of hanging by a thread. They're working hard to stay open, but you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the winter when people have to move back indoors. And that's definitely a regional issue. Mm -hmm. um, it is. It's a, it is a regional issue, um, but there's no easy answer. It's kind of like sending kids back to school. There's not an easy answer to that one right. until we know more about what's happening with the virus. Um, any other comments about the role of your towns? If not, we can go on to question three. Um, all right, what are the challenges your town, each of the three towns is facing that would be easier to address working regionally or with neighboring towns? And uh, as you guys said, Chester, Deep River and Essex are a great example of, you know, there are already so many things that those three towns do together. Uh, but any other challenges you can think of that would be better to handle regionally something that could be done that isn't being done right now? I'll, I'll here again, I'll sort of pop in on this. Um, I'm on the Conservation Commission and the energy team. So it's a little bit of my, uh, my slant. But um, group purchasing, I think, is one area where regionalization could really help. Um, within 10 years, probably 50% of the vehicles, the family vehicles, are going to be electric. Um, and although most people are going to charge those vehicles in their homes, uh, places like hotels, motels, bed and breakfast, Airbnbs, um, for them to be able to purchase uh, 
perhaps charging stations at a much reduced price would be a great benefit. Um, I also see that for uh, school buses, which are a terrible polluting problem right now. Um, some cities are going towards all electric school buses. And uh, of course the, the uh, nine town transit, again, if you could have that be a non-polluting, uh, even propane fired would be uh, a step in the right direction, but I think it requires large purchasing power. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good one, Rick. Uh, a lot of other councils, the governments in the state do provide uh, group purchasing. Maybe that's something now that River Cog has found their legs, they can uh, start looking at working on something on uh, regional purchasing consortia. Yeah, I think the, the capital region does that. I know we've talked about it and said, do we, should we do one in the River Cog region or could we piggyback off of uh, capital regions? But that's, uh, that's a, a good one, Rick and, and Mike. Yeah, well, I think the issue is if, if, if there's a need among our 17 towns or most of our 17 towns that we don't reach the critical mass to buy a lot of these things economically. Yeah. But but whether we piggybacked with Krog, whether we did our own with River Cog, uh, or just promoted pr buying off of the state DAS list on a lot more yeah. products, uh, just some way some way to find uh, to get that get to that economy of scale pricing that none of us reach alone. Uh -huh. I think one of the challenges for Chester um, is talking to some of our larger businesses like Aerovision, Roto Frank, is housing. They, the people that work there, they make a, an okay salary, you know, a living, but they can't afford to live in the, in the town and they can't find housing in, the, in this area. So they have to, you know, Middletown, New London. Um, so trying to find some housing, you know, affordable housing. I think for Chester, we don't really, you know, it's hard for people, to, uh, you have older people who want to downsize, they have these huge houses, but a young family can't come in and start, you know, making a mortgage payment, paying on their cars, their student loans and daycare. It's just too much money going out the door, so. Uh, regarding affordable housing, there are often comments about you know, each of the 17 towns has a responsibility to provide affordable housing, and, and most are trying to do that. And then others will say, well, affordable housing, perhaps you put it where the infrastructure is. And that often means, well, Middletown has the most affordable housing. Uh, what are your thoughts on affordable housing in all the towns? Well, I think it should be looked at as a collective thing because, it, you know, that some towns have more accessible land. I know in Essex, we've struggled to find suitable sites. And um, I, while I I'm totally empathetic with the, 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 the state law, I, I think we should look at it regionally. Mm -hmm. but, but what does that mean in practice? Does that mean all the affordable housing stays in Middletown? Well, no, I think not. Middletown's not the only town that has sites that could be used for affordable housing. Well, we should also look at diversified housing units. I mean, you know, what about ADU? It's like accessory dwelling units. So they allowed per zoning in every town. And, you know, everyone doesn't necessarily need or want a single family traditional home. So. Correct. Well, there's not enough room to do all that development, which I think most towns don't want too much. There's other ways to provide affordable housing and other options. This Maybe is uh, Al Wolfgram. I think the, the vehicle for affordable housing that I've seen in, in towns that I've been working on is the A30G uh, state statute. Mm -hmm. um, that gives uh, the developer the flexibility to do uh, things beyond what the zoning commissions would approve. And I've seen that is the way, that's the vehicle that I've seen to promote affordable housing. But that's forcing the hand of the town, you know. I don't think that's what necessarily how we want to go about it. You know, we don't want to make a town. But, do that's, but that's what's happening. That's what's happening now, Hope. I mean, that's, that's what's being used. I understand that. And my point is if we could do something with zoning, to provide 
other options other than like block apartments somewhere. Uh, and, and when you do 830G, it's a percentage of the town. So what's affordable to, you know, most of the town may not be affordable to a family to live in that. It, it's interesting that 830G is often uh, to a lot of people kind of a scary proposition. Uh, but there have been a number of developments of late um, that, it, that are, have turned out really nicely. Um, I, I think it's becoming more and more accepted, but, uh, but hope I hear what you're saying, you know, accessory dwelling units, uh, you know, what about tiny houses? You know, we've seen a lot of that kind of stuff and, you know, could that ever work in our area? I know we have a lot of septic and not a lot of sewer, but, uh, you know, are tiny houses an opportunity in our area? We're in a little bit more dense development in some areas that are appropriate, obviously. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on uh, what we could do, uh, challenges we could overcome regionally that perhaps you can't with one or two towns? I think I think one of the things we're going to have to look at regionally because it's be well beyond the ability of any individual municipality is is this whole issue of wastewater treatment. Um, I spent some time today reading the Essex uh, plan, and throughout that plan was the concern expressed that the the, the there's the ability to develop additional. Uh, economic opportunity to develop uh, additional housing is in part, and this is I'm way outside of my, you know, knowledge area here, but is is in part based on the ability of the soil and the and the and the septic systems to to handle that. And it it seems to be I, I haven't read the other plans, but other towns, but it seems to be that this is a problem common to this whole area. And I think one of the big things that we're gonna have to address um, is, is, uh, is this wastewater management. Um, and, and that way, I, I think that could have been expanded to include, you know, storm runoff, et, et cetera, so. Mm. Um, in past plans, regionally, I know, and in a lot of our towns, you know, the, the town's policies are still um, sewer avoidance. In a lot of towns, I mean, Old Lyme is still sewer avoidance, yet some of their neighborhoods are starting to, uh, to install, you know, sewers. So, uh, so that's an interesting, an interesting thought, uh, because I think everybody, most are still thinking, you know, we don't want sewers because of, you know, sewer, if you put in sewers, it kind of lifts the cap on what kind of keeps a lid on development, or at least mm -hmm. that's what the thought is. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so you know, if you're talking about larger affordable housing uh, developments, uh, you know, perhaps you do need sewers in some locations. But uh, yeah, the soils and wastewater treatment is an important uh, part of development, and whether it's limited or not. So that's a good point, Mike. Anything else? I think it might be uh, useful. We were talking earlier about about. <clears throat> trails, hiking trails, all that kind of stuff, and uh, recreational trails and biking trails, and uh, you know, obviously some coordination on a regional level uh, in that area, I think, would be sensible. Um, linking linking trails up from one town to the next and developing a network. Mm -hmm. And and promoting regionally too. Exactly. Yeah. I have one other, Henry. Um, I'm uh, in Chester. Um, I don't know whether this is something we could help regionally, but um, the infrastructure of internet in the towns um, may be working together to make that more affordable and or you know pervasively easy to get out of the air. Mm -hmm. You know, wireless in centers of towns across all the towns. Um, something like that might be interesting. Uh -huh. Well, this certainly this last five months has uh, been an indication of how much more uh, working from home is going to occur. Yeah. And, and that really will rely on uh, 
you know, great internet infrastructure. So yes, that it, that will be a recommendation in our plan, Henry. So that's a good point. And I, and I think when we talk about, you know, issues like affordable housing, it's an equity issue as well. Um, there are some families that cannot afford the excessive fees, you know, associated with buying Wi-Fi every month. And um, so we, I think, I think this is a good point that, that we can, if we can come up with some kind of a regional approach to this uh, it would be very beneficial for mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of folks. Uh, this is John Lady from Chester. I think Wi-Fi is fairly readily available. I would challenge you that it's cell service that's the problem, um, specifically in Chester and towards the river. Um, mm -hmm. If you have tourists that are coming down and they're not going to get on your Wi-Fi, they're going to want to call somebody and say, meet me here, come do this, come do that, you know, pick me up this, pick me up that. Um, downtown Chester has terrible um, cell service. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need to think more. Everybody talks Wi-Fi, but, you know, people are using their phones as hotspots. And if you can't use your phone as a hotspot because you don't have cell service, you're still defeating the fact that you can't work where you live. Um, the other issue that I would say is that we need to look at resource sharing not necessarily in purchasing, but we all have challenges when it comes to getting fire marshals. We have trouble getting building inspectors. We have trouble getting ZEOs. Um, we need to start thinking regionally about how we can employ people that may be a tri-town person or maybe dual between Deep River and Chester um, so that we can give people the benefits and the pay that they're looking for as full-time employees instead of trying to find people that are working part-time, four hours, eight hours a week, um, that can't really serve the public in the way that needs to be served. Um, so I think that's another thing that I would, I would stress as a way to actually maybe save money, um, but become more effective in, in working with our community. Uh, John, Rivercog is looking at the idea of, of uh, employing those kind of folks like a, uh, you know, a planner that can be, uh, you know, sent out to the towns, do, do a little bit of work at Portland, Chester, whatever. But we've talked about assessors, um, you know, building officials. We do zoning officer work like that. I think you know that. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good one too. Um, sharing of resources. And, and certainly no offense taken. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right, Mr. Guskowski, who's one of one of the best in the business. <laughs> All right, should we go on to question number four? Sure. This is a good one. Um, what do we do well in our region, and what could we do better? Well, certainly the transit system, I think, is really really a, a something to be very proud of, the nine-track town bus. Maybe it could be expanded. Uh, there are discussions about um, merging with the Middletown group uh, to do just that. And, and I also think we hope the open space infrastructure, we do that very well. And there's a I think there's a coordinated effort with, uh, with open space trying to link the different towns. Mm -hmm. This is Al Wilkin. I think our regional education system is very good and we should be able to uh, sort of expand on that somehow. Mm -hmm. You mean like uh, Middlesex Community College? Uh, no, just the high school system and, and, oh, okay. and going from there. You know, we have a very good, uh, you know, elementary, junior, senior high system and uh, expanding on that. Mm -hmm. Do you think we could do better as a region? <clears throat> Regional purchasing would be one. Rick brought that up. Um, John Lady again, I know that um, Susan's talked about this quite a bit, but I think that moving here in 87 from Texas, one of the things that we seriously lack 
in this 17 town reason um, area is that we have so much to offer from sporting to water sports to arts to music to sculpture. We do a terrible job at promoting the lower Connecticut River Valley. Mm -hmm. um, we don't reach out to New York. We don't reach out to Boston, to the Globe or to the Times and really try to sell what we have. Everybody's so worried about making sure that the local population is served. I think they're served really well. Um, I don't think that we serve our restaurants and our um, commercial um, businesses well because we're too afraid to bring in more people from the outside to come in for the day, spend their money, and then go home. We don't do what we don't have any um, other than the Grizz and Airbnb places for people to stay, to spend the evening, right. to stay overnight, um, to spend a week in our region. Um, but yet we have the one of the prettiest boating areas in the whole United States. And it's just it just um, baffles me in a way that we can't work together to promote this region as becoming one of the best areas in the United States to live, work, and play. Well, I think that goes back to that whole branding issue. I, yeah. I don't think we look at it that way, but really, we should. Yeah, yeah John, I think that's a good point. Um, one issue that came up uh, recently was somebody I was talking about where a lot of people come by boat. They'll come from Long Island or, you know, all over and they like to come and stop and they'll stay in Essex, but then it's, what else, what's there to do? You know, if they could come and dock in Essex, is there a way, is there a way to get them to, you know, the muster or to Chester right. at the gallery night or something? Right. Where, right. Um, Cause Essex is only so big and offers only so much. Right. So we bring them in, have them stay the week at the island or wherever, and then go tour the valley from there. Mm -hmm. I, just are in the five marinas that are, or the four that are, you know, within, you know, you could, you could walk, but it's kind of a distance. There's over 650 boats that sit in those marinas. That didn't even include okay. Chris Holm and Middlesex. And, and Deep River has, you know, major marina as well. And I don't think that we serve that population. And with COVID, um, you know, boat sales are off the hook. You know, you can't even, you can't even go buy a boat. You can't find a motor for a boat. Um, just like you can't find a motorcycle you, in, you know, in our housing market has, has values have skyrocketed in the last five months. Yeah. You know, so there's, we do a lot of good things once people discover us. Um, but we need to make it where we're serving that, you know, that daily community a little bit better. <laughs> Yeah, th this is George. Uh, I belong to the Essex Yacht Club. And when transients come in, we give them a folder, a pamphlet for the town itself oh, uh, nice. so that they know, you know, what they can buy, et cetera. But maybe it can go beyond that and maybe it can be for the other towns also. So that when we get people up here, um, you know, they can get to some of the other towns and their activities. There should be a regional pamphlet. Right, yeah. that'd be awesome. It's, that's been mentioned. And a regional uh, transit shuttle. Yeah, yeah. And, and all of the marinas, all of the marinas could be putting these things out. Mm -hmm. Anything else? You want to move on to five? Sure. I don't want to stop these comments. There are a lot of good comments were just made. Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing we've talked about is we didn't want our regional plan of conservation development to be one of those top-down plans. We want it to be useful to our towns. Uh, so does anybody have any thoughts on how this regional plan could support your town? What kind of policies or recommendations, they'll be regional, but what can be said that would be supportive to your towns? I, I have one question for you, um, John Levy again. So what I, what a death knell this could be, if you spend all this time making a regional plan of conservation development that was a pamphlet that went and sat on somebody's shelf. 
Yeah, that's what so, we want to avoid. As a master planning person, as an architect, it happens all the time. We need to try to make this a living document. It needs to live on the internet. It needs to live through publication. It needs to live through update. Um, you know, we can't just do this and come back in 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, we really need Rivercog to continue to push yearly um, what comes out of this so that, you know, just as we try to do our planet conservation developments for our own town, um, we have to continue to do, to do it for the region. So I'm hoping that we're not thinking this is a one shot or a one off deal that we're looking at this because times will change just like they did under COVID. And yep. we have to be able to react and, and um, look for ways to continue to support um, the community. That is our intention, John. You're absolutely right. Any other thoughts on how the plan can support? This is Henry again. Uh, I, one of the things about the Chester has as a problem that may not be a problem in other towns is a real parking crisis. And I, I really think that maybe, um, you know, thinking about a regional shuttle plan that would include, you know, local legs and intertown plans might help that part mm -hmm. of the crisis. Okay, thanks, Henry. Anybody else? Yeah, S Susan Wright, um, Chester. Uh, one thought that I have is that possibly just to pick and I, you know, you're probably already going to do this, but to pick the top two or three things and not make it something that has 16 things to start with and actually do, you know, pick a, something that we can do and succeed at to show people that this is going to be a benefit. Because uh -huh. I, I think a lot of times we, you, we start off and get all of these plans, all of these things that happen, and then they don't. And it's like the Chester, you know, there's stuff happening in Chester, but our plan of conservation and development, you know, as a group, some of us are working on things, but we haven't met together as, a, as the boards and commissions and really talked about the plan. And I think that that gets uh, frustrating for people because they, they spend all this time doing it. And as John said, we want it to be living and breathing. Um, and sometimes that's hard to, to do and I, I can't I don't even know how it's going to work with 17 um, different things but to me I would be picking a few ideas and then have a real task list and and times and who's doing what and when things need to be done by so that we can actually move it forward because mm -hmm. it is hard to start I, I think it's hard to manage 17 different towns to do it or 14 I, mm -hmm. I see it's hard to do one town so I don't know but Okay, good. Thanks, Susan. But John and Susan, that's great. Anything else? Um, just Cindy from Chester again, just um, as we're all very concerned, um, our focus really needs to be, you know, the COVID-19 recovery and reopening and supporting each other through that economically um, and for our businesses. And I know we're all really concerned about that. And, you know, as Susan had um, alluded to before, the, the businesses in downtown Chester, between COVID and, and uh, the project, you know, which was anticipated, um, but the COVID wasn't. And, but even all the towns, I'm sure, a lot of businesses may not be able to sustain themselves. So whatever we can do, um, in our plan and now to support our recovery as we reopen, if we reopen fully, you know, for a while. So it's, mm -hmm. we're, we're fa we could be facing a huge crisis with loss of business and mm -hmm. tax bases and everything else. So very concerning. Yeah. Okay. That's a good, uh, good, good comment here towards the end. Well, anything else, or should I turn it back to Megan? Can I, I, I just want to anybody to, off of ideas? No, this is Tony Waldeck. I just want to jump in for two seconds. Um, Hi, Tony. Hey, so there was a couple of, um, I chimed in on the group chat, and so did 
Lauren Gister, I guess. Um, I just want to make sure those comments made it into all this. And my other thing I wanted to piggyback on was, I've heard this mentioned a couple times now, but to get in between the three towns, um, I always always thought of like Old Saybrook had the you know the, the trolley that was on, wasn't on tracks but it was on tires. But mm -hmm. maybe something for our three towns is something that should be looked at like that. I mean, you know, we all all three towns have stuff to offer, and I mean to get around like that would probably be be a, a, a lot easier. I mean, just the thought of mine that you know something to think about. I just. Uh -huh. Yeah, because parking's a problem with all three towns. Okay, good. I was just uh, making sure I got those comments out of the chat. Thanks, Tony. Um, anybody else? I just want to say that the the fact that you're we're doing this, you know, focusing on the, all the region will help support the, each town individually. And if, you know, like John said, if we can focus on maybe branding or getting people to, to tour the region, think of the region as a tourist, not as Essex as the tourist place or Chester as like, you know, artsy gallery place, like this whole area should be considered a tourist, you know, like the Berkshires, I don't know who said mm -hmm. that, but yeah. reimagining re it like that. Yeah, that's, great yep, idea. that's the point, Hope. Yeah, and the individual towns will help or will uh, will prosper through, you know, regional branding yeah. of the area when people come. That's good. Anything else? Well, Alan, should uh, I'm, I'll throw it back to Megan unless there's anything else. I think that's fine. I, I think we're done with the uh, question and answer session. Okay. That was all great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Megan, why don't you... Take us on home. Perfect. So uh, thank you again so much for your participation and for joining us. We heard a lot of really interesting things um, and we will be taking that back to compile with everything that we've heard from the rest of the towns. And all of this information will inform all of our policies and goals in the plan as we move forward. And there are plenty of other ways for you all to get involved. Um, these include visiting the website, rivercogregionalplan.org, signing up for email notifications, sharing the presentations and outreach materials with others in your community. And they are also welcome to share responses to these questions if they would like to. Uh, all thoughts are welcome. Uh, and signing up for notifications means that you'll be kept informed of upcoming meetings, project news, links to documents, uh, presentation and videos as they're posted online. And you can also reach out to your RPC member via the link on the website with any thoughts, comments, or concerns. The RPC will be meeting regularly to review drafts of the RPOCD and direct the policies in it, and they're here to represent you. So let's review a breakdown of the timeline. Um, this was shown in the introductory presentation, and it's also available on the project website, so you can follow along with the process. We kicked off the project in winter of 2019, and we anticipate completion in spring of 2021. We're in phase two at the municipal meetings, which is in the second column, second line. We'll be holding meetings just like this. Uh, we started in July, we've been going through August, and we have one, I think, outstanding in September. Um, concurrently with this process, our team has been hard at work creating an existing conditions report for the region. So the next step in this process, after we complete the municipal meetings, will be to get a draft existing conditions report to the RPC members, and they will review that. And this is an opportunity for you to reach out to your RPC members with your thoughts, comments, or concerns, um, and key issues that you see for your town or the region. And your RPC member can make sure that these items are adequately addressed in the existing conditions report and can also answer questions you may have. And at this point, I would open it up to any questions and I will leave this contact information for a moment in case anyone wants to write it down. The really important one is the website at the bottom because all of this information is also there. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening, for bearing with us. For this mm -hmm. meeting. 
Yeah, definitely want to thank um, Alan as our host, but also John Lavi and uh, Tony Balduck, the other two chairs, uh, for bringing your commissions to us in one meeting. That was really great. Okay, well, uh, this is Alan. I'd like to thank uh, Megan for your excellent presentation and Torrance for leading us through that <coughs> lively uh, discussion section session. Um, um, uh, if there are no further questions, uh, I think at this time, the Essex Planning Commission will resume its, its meeting and uh, thank you all for attending and uh, you're, you're welcome to sit and listen to our meeting, but <laughs> otherwise, I'll see you later. Thank you very Thanks much, Alan. Appreciate thank you. it. And, thank uh, you. Thanks, thank you. John Guskowski, for uh, coordinating this. Of course, we'll send you the, uh, the thanks, recording John. link uh, later this week. Okay, send us a bill. Oh, uh, oh, as always. <laughs> thanks, All right, everyone. goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye, Torrance. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. All right, so Essex Planning Commission members, uh, please, Planning Commission member, please continue to stay on the call. Uh, so, uh, I guess we're, we're on to old business now. Uh, uh, John, item 4A is uh, the subdivision application. That's scheduled for next September, right? So, right. there's no, so nothing to discuss now. No discussion necessary. Okay. So, let's move to item 4B. Uh, you put some materials in our packet about the Nas National Register of Historic Places. Uh, do you want to take charge right. of that? So, discussion? yeah, just very briefly. Um, after, after discussing sort of the status of our documentation with uh, Hope and Jane, um, I reached out to a, a friend of mine who is a historic architect and asked her, uh, shared the same information with her and, and basically asked the question, what would it take to turn the work that we've done so far um, into a workable nomination for the village of Essex to, to be submitted uh, for consideration for the National Register of Historic Places. Mm -hmm. So she, um, her name is Lynn Smith. Um, she uh, provided me basically a proposal for those services, which I believe is approximately $16,000 if memory serves, I don't have the document open in front of me. Um, so that's the that's her estimate of cost and, and that's uh, does not sound exorbitant to me given, I mean, I know what Lynn's rates are and mm -hmm. her expertise that seems reasonable. Um, and so the next question is paying for it. Um, the state does have, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, SHPO, does have what they call a Historic Preservation Survey and Planning Grant available um, to help fund this uh, sort of work. Um, the trick there is a nomination um, falls under a, a category of grant that would only be matched uh, basically one for one. Uh, so 50% of the total project cost would be covered by the state. Um, and 50% would have to be covered locally. Um, I think some of my, it, and you can't, you can't use like staff salaries. Um, <laughs> however, I am not technically staff. Um, I am a consultant and, and I think a portion of the funds that are devoted to my work could be used as match, um, but I don't think totally used as match and we would have to try to figure out, uh, I, you know, my suspicion is we could probably, you know, say four or six thousand dollars of my of my expenses could be devoted towards this project, um, and you know, say the total project cost is twenty thousand. We're still a little bit of a gap, mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, you know, is the commission on board with sort of proceeding with pursuing the grant? And if so, what would be your recommendations in terms of uh, seeking those funds, those local match funds? Mm -hmm. This is uh, Al Wolfram. Can we get a competitive proposal? Well, the grant, I was just gonna say, the grant does state it has yeah. to be Okay. It will be right. It will be competitive. Um, but this was just we just in terms of the, I, I should have mentioned that the, the the proposal was to get a sense of what the what the general cost would be what how much grant should we ask for okay yeah no it will it will be bid out yes absolutely okay all right hey, hey john yeah uh, it's george um uh, does norm uh know about what we're trying to do and if so would he be willing to come up with some money to do this 
Um, I, I've talked with him briefly about it. We haven't really discussed the money end of it. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I, that's, you know, would be one, of, I, I if think one of my suggestions would be to, you know, ask the selectmen right. ultimately, you know, to, to use some discretionary funds. Yeah, because I'm sure that they've got, it's not, if you're getting the grant, then you're talking about 8,000, give or take, and, you know, he could probably find the money. Uh, I, just as a, a question, John, what would your fee be for getting the grant? Oh, for writing? No, that would just be included in, in my work for the town. But I mean, but we but could, would, but but we could it, count that. We could be? count that time. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it, probably thousand to fifteen hundred bucks to to do that, and then you know some administrative on it. So we could probably count okay. two or three thousand dollars. Okay. It just seems like the right thing to do for the town. We should have had this done years ago, yeah. and it's a good investment. Just as a, a uh, devil's advocate question, what is the negative part of, of declaring Essex Village as a National Historic Preservation Area? <laughs> the, honestly, the, the negative part is the and this is my this is my opinion. Um, I think the negative part is the perception that it's a historic district and right. uh, there will be some sort of zoning or regulatory control. And so it's it's sort of the the perception um, <clears throat> the misperception the misperception public education <laughs> requirement. But it's it's exclusively uh, honorary and and the 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 benefit it it unlocks um, potential. Uh, historic preservation tax credits for restoration projects and how much uh public input from the um entities involved in this district would there have to be during this grant process um i think you know they're participating in some public information meetings um but a, a number of them have already been contacted back well this is going back seven or eight years now when we actually did sort of the first round of documentation um, yeah. of some of the properties, but it's, it, it, you know, people don't, you know, uh, property owners don't have to sort of sign up for it or, you know, you don't need like a majority or a, you know, um, or, or anything like that. Uh, it's, yeah. but I, mean, but, I remember know, going through the involved. historic district where we were trying to do and he got a big backlash. Right. Like people didn't want to do a historic district. Which so, was a, yeah, it was a regulatory uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's what's great about this is there is no restrictions on the homeowners, but yet knowing that they live in a historic place, perhaps now, you know, people will have more uh, pause before they decide to just do what they're doing, you know, design wise. Yeah. Maybe they'll have more That's questions. my point. It's, it's the, it's the uh, uh, perception of what this means to be property owners within the district. To make sure it's a positive thing, not a negative thing. Right. So I would, I would hope that maybe the, the planning commission could help take the lead, maybe along with the historical society, um, and even maybe economic development in, in doing some public outreach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would probably be sensible. Yeah. I, it sounds like we're all in favor of it, John. Uh, I mean, we're maybe, maybe we're all in favor of you going to talk to Norm and seeing if you can dig, dig up some money oh, for it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm happy my, to whole, do, my, yeah. my whole thing is historic preservation. I mean, we have a great historic area here, and, and whatever we can to preserve what's here is, is um, a good thing. But I think this is one step closer to that. Without having yeah, it is. It's a, yeah. it's, a, it's, a small, it's a smaller step, but it is a good step in that direction. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think we're all in favor of, of you having a conversation with Norm, okay. and, and I think we're probably all also all in favor of, uh, of considering how we can uh, have some public education about this, um, whatever yeah. that means. Maybe, I don't know what form that would take exactly. Yeah, we, could, so we, we could, can make we can make a motion to direct uh, <clears throat> our planner to approach the uh, the, ten, the board of selectmen with this idea, with our backing. Uh, are yeah. you proposing that motion now? Yeah, if that is okay. if that makes it official, yeah, we should do something. Yes. Okay. Well, so, wait, wait, before we do that, John, uh, I would do this here. 
Um, I'm muted. No, nope. you're muted, you're muted you're again, muted James. Now. Okay. Unmute, please. Can't hear you, Jane. Okay. There you go. There we go. How about uh, getting um, the Sustainable Essex Committee, since this is part of their agenda also, along with the Economic Development Commission and the Historical Society, maybe we could get a sort of joint effort to approach Norm. It might ha have more sway. Okay, so I could I should maybe get get uh, cosigns from EDC, Sustainable Essex, and Historical Society. I think that'd be a good good and idea. And we can we yeah. can le lead the coalition. Yeah. Okay, I mean if that so, Al, you want to make that motion? Yeah, I'll amend my motion to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a second on that motion? Second. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Thank you, John. Project. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on to ex uh, to item. Unless there's anything more there, John, did you have more to say on? No. Uh, item 5A, reports of committees and officers. Uh, I don't think we got a report. Did we from Sandra this month, John? No, I don't. I think I they're think... just preparing for this, this yeah. uh, presentation. I think we just went through an hour and a half of that report. Exactly. How about uh, item 5B, George? Anything from EDC? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, let's see. What about those meetings you're having with Essex, uh, East Haddam and Haddam and Jester and Deep River? I know, nobody told me. <laughs> Is Susan Mallon having those meetings? Uh oh, it's George. Oh, there you go. George? What? Yes. What, 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 I'm sorry, what did you say? We were, we, we were curious about that. Somebody was referring to the, uh, the five towns that are collaborating, the e five EDCs that are getting together and regionally talking about issues. Yeah. I don't, I'll have to find out. Because, I mean, with the COVID thing, we didn't have a meeting the last time. So, uh, oh, but I'll find that out. Okay. Uh, but going on with this, uh, the former red balloon, you notice that that is demolished. And um, there, there's a, a proposed tenant for olive oils, the old olive oils. And uh, let's see, Abby's restaurant is closed and Safe Harbors is, has got a couple of interested parties to take that over as a restaurant. Um, the Indoor Golf Center uh, is approved and is actually open. Oh, are we here? Yeah, we're here. We're loving it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, Cyrene is open for lunch and dinner. Uh, and from what I understand, it's it's really working out pretty well. Which uh, restaurant is that? Uh, the, the Cyrene's out on the island. On the island, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 yeah that, that's going. Uh, the little the little dry cleaner in, in Centerbrook, like it's near the farm, right next to the pharmacy, that went out, closed. It did? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gather is now back in service on Main Street in Ireton, which I think you probably knew anyway. And uh, there's a gym that's operating in Middletown, and they're looking to relocate in Essex. Obviously, they've got to find some space, so... Um, and Coffee Roaster is looking for a space in Essex also. So we do have some, some positive things going on. Uh, I'm just hoping that, um, you know, we get through the COVID situation and we don't lose too many stores in town. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's could be a problem. Uh, just, just a question on the red balloon. What's going on in their driveway? Yeah, what they're doing is there's, there's a... a they're putting a, a new septic in the back part of that for, for, uh, for yeah, for um, the restaurant. Oh, they're expanding the restaurant septic system. Y yes. Okay. Yeah. That, they're putting a whole one in there. Yep. For what? For they Carl have one in the, Carlson's they have one in the driveway going in. Yeah. There's going to be a driveway there. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Oh, this, this is voluntary. What's it for? 
They already What's what? Well, that's, so it's, they're voluntarily putting in a new septic system or are they going to expand? No, no, they're not expanding. They needed to redo it, I guess. Well, for the new restaurant or for Carlson's Landing? Carlson's Landing. You mean the new septic system they put in their driveway isn't working? Yeah. Oh, okay. That I don't know. Uh, but I, they, I yeah. do know they said that they were, they were putting a septic in there. I thought okay. that they w wanted to open a restaurant in that building. Yeah, that's what I thought. And We're all of us. Maybe this is, you know. Uh, no, what, thinking. what that, that was going to be kind of a takeout type place. And uh, they decided with COVID coming, they decided not to do it. Yeah, takeout has less septic um, uh, requirements anyways. Right. Okay, uh, that's all I've got. Thank you, George. Planners report. Uh, okay, a couple of brief things. We talked about National Register of Historic Places. Um, another acronym starting with N is the, Nash, the uh, Natural Hazards Mitigation Plan um, that's, that River Cog is also working on. Mm -hmm. um, we, I worked with um, the Public Works Director, Health Director, and Maria Lucarelli in the Selectman's Office to edit the, um, basically the complete first draft or what should probably be pretty close to the, to the, to the final draft, I should say, of the, um, there's a, it's a comprehensive region-wide plan um, and then each town within the, um, the region has basically a, an appendix um, for the plan and that basically took a look at our, you know, our, our high hazard or our high uh, repetitive loss properties um, to kind of drill down on some of the action steps that each municipality was going to basically pledge to do. Um, so we finished that in the last couple of weeks, um, that review. Um, so the COG uh, and their consultants should be putting together sort of the final plan, I would assume, and have some sort of final public airing of it or public um, comment period. Uh, and then I would suspect probably in the early fall, they will seek to uh, get local endorsements of the plan. So I would suspect that would probably be both the planning commission and perhaps the selectmen would be, would be asked to adopt um, at least our annex of the plan. Um, so that's coming. And as soon as there's a sort of a link of the completed draft, I will send it out. Um, and then we talked last month about the steep grant possibilities. Um, and the selectmen basically for lack of, uh, there really wasn't that much money available for steep, um, only $128,000 per town. Um, and I think that was basically divided up that way to make every eligible town able to get some steep money um, if they applied, um, which is f a fine goal. But what it means is that every town gets a, a, a small project rather than you know a smaller number of towns getting bigger projects. So um, ultimately what the selectmen decided on was to help out the, um, the HOPE partnership project at Spencer's Corner. Um, and so we're applying for money to help um, their external site developments um, to basically redo the redo the parking lot that had to get all torn up to put in septic systems and that would include uh, walkways and and pedestrian lighting uh, to go between parking lots and the buildings and with be, between the buildings themselves so uh, basically exterior site enhancement um, uh, which will be matched by the um, the owners of the individual commercial condos at uh, Spencer's corner um, and so that grant is due at the end of this month. There was a extension given because of um, uh, uh, probably the power outages and, and that sort of thing. Um, so we're, we're working with that. I'm working with Hope Partnership and with um, uh, Maria in, in the Selectman's office on writing that grant. Um, and I think that's it from my report. I, had, I, w I was curious if any of the commissioners participated in the selectmen's meeting um, to discuss the potential commission merger if the, if anyone if you want participated in that and, and um, I I think things probably got backburnered a little bit because of COVID and power outages but didn't know if anyone had, had stayed up with the selectmen on that did not okay no we didn't Ralph Monaco did though oh did he I, I haven't I haven't heard a uh, report but okay all right I was just curious that's all I have all right, well, thank you, John. And thank you all for sitting through the uh, presentation tonight. Uh, <clears throat> motion to adjourn. So moved.
Second. Second. That's George. All in favor? Aye. All in. Aye. All right. We're uh, opposed? Okay, we're adjourned, folks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. See you next yep. month.